Hey guys, this is Kim Lapree from the Teachers Need Teachers podcast. I'm a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual host. Be sure to check out all of the other amazing podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com and get ready because the learning begins in three, two, one. Hey, tribe. Producer Chris here checking in. Matt and Casey have the week off because of Thanksgiving. So we're going to dip back into the archives for a Google Teacher Tribe replay. In this week's replay, we're going to go back to episode 36, where Matt and Casey spoke with Wanda Terrell. Wanda is a district technology coordinator for the Lakeland School System in Tennessee. And in this episode, Terrell shares creative ideas for using Google Drawings. You can check the show notes for this episode at googleteachertribe.com slash 36. We hope you had a great Thanksgiving. We hope you're ready for the holiday season. And now, enjoy once again, episode 36. Hey, Tribe. Well, if you're listening to this episode when it just came out, that means that it is officially December 25th. So if you are the Christmas type person, then Merry Christmas. And I know that for a lot of people, um, during this next this next week or so, like that time between Christmas and New Year's, it's like you know, stay in your pajama pants and veg on the couch and try to relax. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious about this. Uh, Casey, is this one of those times for you where it's like time to disconnect from stuff and, and recharge a little bit? Definitely. It, it always is. You know, we work so hard during the school year. And I know all the teachers who are listening, everybody is on the countdown. And you're on the countdown to one, spend some time with your family. And you've probably got a million things you still have to do before um, you can really relax. But hopefully, you know, everybody is having a wonderful Christmas day. You're spending time with those that, that you love and you've had some fun. Maybe you're sipping some cocoa, watching some football. And um, those are the types of things that I like to do. I tend to take some digital diets during that time. Oh, too. That's a, yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, you know, sometimes I have to disconnect because as a very connected person, it it it, it is something that I'm constantly working on and so I sometimes I just have to say, you know what? Today I'm not on social media or today I'm not checking email. This is this is, you know, this is a day that I'm just going to rest and relax and recharge. But with that in mind, that's that's why we went ahead and put out an episode on Christmas Day, because we are hoping that some of you are using this day to recharge with some googly ideas for your classroom. So today, today we have some of those ideas for you. So, Casey, you want to tell them a little bit about it? So in today's very special Christmas episode, we have a gift to give you. We are giving you Wanda Terrell. Wanda is our special guest today, and she has some fabulous ideas on how to tap into creativity with Google Drawings. And she has tons of ideas and lessons and templates that we are going to share with you, as well as some pretty awesome Google News and updates and some feedback from our listeners. And of course, we've got a couple of things to share from the blog as well. All right, Casey, you ready to hitch the reindeer to the sleigh and fly on into this episode? Reindeer cam is ready. Let's go. <laughs> So for today's Google news and updates, we've got a bunch of little changes that you may have either noticed or will start noticing pretty soon in Google Drive and some other Google tools. And the first one has to do with how you view photos from Google Drive. You may have noticed at some point there is a little tab on the left side of your Google Drive that says Google Photos. Google Photos, I love, by the way. Um, I have the app installed on my phone, and Google Photos automatically syncs the photos that I take on my phone to my Google account. Just automatically uploads them whenever I connect to Wi-Fi, which is great. Um, the little small change is that that tab in Google Drive that says Google Photos is going away. Uh, so in January sometime, 
January 2018, that little tab will disappear, which is not that big of a deal because you can still access it from pretty much anywhere. Casey and I were guessing that probably nobody clicks on that button and Google just decided to get rid of it. So starting in January 2018, you will stop seeing that Google Photos button in your drive. And we also have a few updates just coming up into the navigation of Google Docs and Google Slides. So uh, we we will see these coming early January, so they're not quite there yet. But, for instance, in Docs and Slides, when you go to Format, and usually you go to Lists to see the different ways to add some bullets and things like that, that's actually going to be renamed Bullets and Numbering. And uh, in Docs and Slides, where we have show spelling suggestions is just going to be renamed to spelling and move from the view menu to the tools menu. And then in docs, the document outline has been renamed show document outline and move from the tools menu to the view menu. So we're moving a, moving some things back and forth. And then in slides, when you go to import slides, um, it's been removed from the insert menu. So I'm not sure what implications that may have for some users, but um, they've got a little screenshot in the blog post. And according to the release track, it, it will be coming in the first week of January to all G Suite editions. So, so look for that coming soon. Hooray. All right. Very good. Now, if you use YouTube very much, there is a part of YouTube called Creator Studio that basically lets you make changes to the videos that you've got and do some neat things with it. Well, YouTube is kind of rebranding this whole thing. They're going to turn YouTube Creator Studio to just YouTube Studio. And if it was just a name, that wouldn't be much of a big deal. But they're they're planning on adding what they call... This is like the official wording here, a bunch of features. <laughs> Thanks for giving us some, a whole bunch of detailed information about this. But they're just starting to do it. And so they're they're asking for feedback. But they also say that they're going to give us some more, uh, some more data when it comes to uh, what's going on with our videos, a different way to manage our videos, uh, some different things with account access if you need to switch between accounts. So there's some things that will change there. Um, my hope is that they'll add some sort of um, video editing capability that's similar to the the YouTube editor that they killed off not too long ago. You used to be able to go to youtube.com slash editor and kind of like package video clips together. And if this is something that exists already in YouTube and I'm missing it, then please let me know. But um, that's one feature that I kind of miss. So my hope is that when they do that, that they'll, they'll include a little bit of, of video editing on the fly on the web like that. And I did play around with this a little bit. I was in my YouTube channel today uh, editing a video and I saw the option. I'm like, what's this? YouTube Studio. And so when you're in your channel and you go to edit a video, you'll see the button to actually try this out. And the interface is much more user friendly. Uh, it is much more visually driven. So I, I think they're they're really trying to improve it because trust me, that that little section could could use some enhancement. But but um, so so look for that if you are a YouTuber. We also have a pretty cool video uh, that that Google has shared with us called the year in search. And these are the questions that everyone was Googling in 2017. And so when you click on the, the link in our show notes, which, by the way, is Google Teacher Tribe dot com slash 36, you can watch the video and it's very powerful. And of course, it, it shows, you know, historical events pop culture events, all kinds of things that were going on during a very crazy year in the United States. I would say that for sure, but but beyond as well. And so so you can find out what everybody was searching for and sort of, you know, this time of year when we start to reflect and look back on what all happened in the year of 2017. I think this is a really good look at that. Yeah, I'm always fascinated to see what people put into Google searches and it it sort of shows what's in the collective mindset of the, you know, the country and the world and everything. And speaking of that, kind of tying into that, there's this neat tool uh, that Google has had since November of 2016 called Quick Draw, where basically it's this game where they give you a uh, 
something to draw. It could be a cat or a snowflake or an ice cream cone. And you try to draw it and Google tries to use its neural network to guess. You know, that's where they put together all of these pictures that other people have drawn. And it tries to say based on those other drawings that you've just drawn. Google has done a little bit of reviewing over all of those drawings that they've collected. And it says that people through Quick Draw have drawn 2.9 million cats, 2.9 million hot dogs, and 2.9 million snowflakes, among other things. It looks at the, and it draws some some conclusions based on these pictures. Um, like, for instance, of the smiley fa- or of the faces. If you ask someone to draw a face, it says that almost everybody that draws a face draws a smiling face. So draw whatever conclusions you will from that. Um, (laughs) The other thing that's interesting is they show that whenever people draw pictures of things from different countries, that there are different ways of looking at it. Like, for instance, if they if it asked you to draw an ice cream cone, if you were in South Korea, you would draw two it looks like two scoops of ice cream. If you're in Italy, it's three scoops. And if you're in Australia, it's one great big scoop. That's just the general way that people uh, picture those those images and draw them. So, kind of fascinating to see what they what they pull out of out of all of this. And um, so it's and it's also fascinating to see how when they gather all of this data, what they're able to predict and guess and machine learning and all that just fascinates me. It is. That, that was a word that I was thinking. I was like, this is completely fascinating. I mean, how many cats did they draw? And the whole ice cream analogy, you yeah. know, who, who who would ever, you know, think about something like that? But it is interesting data to go back and look at, even though, you know, people are doodling what that tells us about, um, you know, various cultures and genders and, and smiley faces versus the frowny. Fa- I'm going to, I'm going to draw a frowny face from now on. So. Oh, so that wraps up I, our, our look at the Google news and update. So we hope everybody picks up a, a new, new little idea in here and look for some fun updates in 2018. Hey, Tribe, I am super excited to introduce our next guest. Uh, Today, we have the wonderful Wanda Terrell joining us. She is the District Technology Coordinator for the Lakeland School System in Tennessee. Wanda has a, a fantastic background in history. First of all, have to mention that she was also part of our Google Teacher Academy in Austin, Texas. We are all family, uh, but Wanda is a wonderful digital leader in her job and beyond. And she has a fabulous blog where she shares all of her resources and sketch notes. It's ignitionedu.com. You should definitely go check it out. And welcome to the show, Wanda. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. We are excited to to share some of the amazing things that you are doing. And of course, you have shared a wonderful lesson plan that we're going to jump into. And we have links to everything for everyone in the show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash 36. To, to kind of kick this off, Wanda, you, you mentioned something about, about creativity there, and that's kind of what this, this episode is all about. Um, and I know sometimes when people think about G Suite, and they think about docs and slides and drawings and all these different things. They think, oh, well, that's what we use to write essays or to do presentations in front of the class or something. And sometimes creativity isn't the first thing that pops into people's heads when they talk about G Suite. But there really is some potential for students and adults to do some really creative things with it, right? Absolutely. Once you get the hang of using the tool and you feel comfortable with that, then you're able to kind of push outside of the the boundaries of that comfort zone and start to see ways that you can use the tools in different ways. What I really like about Google Drawings, and I I call it the gateway drug to Google Apps, um, (laughs) because it's so easy and it's so fun. Even before Google kicked off, especially in our area, We were very Mac heavy. Um, They would use the drawing tools in Apple Works, good old Apple Works. It was a good way to transition things over 
because they wanted to have the ability for kids to do some digital drawing, especially for the little ones, getting used to using the trackpad, using a mouse. But it doesn't feel like work because you're sitting there and you're creating and you're drawing. With Google Drawings, you can bring in things from the internet so easily. And with Google Classroom, it's easy for teachers to push out templates so that the students don't have to create things from scratch. You can really focus on the skill and the content that you're trying to focus on. It's just a great little hidden tool that I always try to show when I get the chance because it, it's just got so many good features in it. Isn't that the great thing when they're learning and they're being creative and they don't even realize it, that it's just, you know, happening in the, in in front of you as a teacher. And that's usually when you have those those times when the bell rings and the kids don't even notice because they're just so enthralled in whatever it is that they're creating. And you have given us some fabulous ideas for for how we can use Google Drawings in the classroom. Would you would you mind jumping into some of those examples like the memes and timelines? and et cetera. I really like the meme activity and you'll have to forgive my picture on the, um, on the sample there. Um, we're going to enjoy your picture. That's what we're going to really like about it because it's you. Um, but, but one of the, one of the ways that I really like to use that meme activity is, and this is applicable to just about any subject area. Think about something that you're studying that has a personality. Make a meme of that, you know, have a little picture of a gold bar and come up with some kind of uh, statement that, that the gold bar might say. Use a, use a character from a novel and, you know, say what, what meme would the character use in chapter four, you know, and just try to tie something fun into reinforcing what you're already doing in the classroom. That's one way I like to use the memes. There are some other things in there that are really handy. There's a, a set of graphic organizers that the fabulous Eric Kurtz um, has put out on his great website. And I make sure to highlight that because I'm all about working smarter and not harder. The stuff that Eric puts out there for people to use, it, it just fills that bill to no end. And he's got a great shared Google folder of graphic organizers that you can download it, it. They're all set up in Google drawings. You could push those out to students. And I like to use those because there, there are so many teachers out there who are still focused on the interactive boards and we have this technology, we've got to use it. But the problem with those is that you've got one, maybe two kids at the board at a time, and you don't get to get the participation from everybody. And maybe your school district doesn't have Nearpod or something else. You could push out a Google drawing of what you've got students doing on the interactive board and every kid in the room now is interacting with that template, even though there may be one or two kids up at the board, now you have evidence of all of the students doing the learning because you have that activity in Google Drawings. Kids turn it in and you, you're able to check individuals that way. So two of my favorites. Those are really good ones. Yeah. You know, one of the things that a lot of these activities seem to have in common is that they they pull together text and images very well. And that's something that I'm real big on. Also being a fellow sketchnote aficionado, you know, that's that's one of the big things and one of the brain friendly things that that all of this does. And I've found in some places where it feels like when you try to pull images into a lesson, you know, if you try to add pictures to a report or if you try to put pictures in a book or something like that, that people start to think, you know, the older kids get the less they need pictures. But I feel like and I know that there's there's science that backs this up, that including images in activities like the ones that you're you're suggesting has real benefits. I wondered if you if you had a take on that. It does. That whole dual coding theory where right. you're, if you're putting things into your brain in multiple ways, you're able to get more stuff in there. Not to mention the fact that it makes it fun at the same time. Yeah. One of the things I did want to add about Google Drawings is that, and you were talking about bringing things in from the web and doing that stuff. A lot of people look at Google Drawings from 
Google Docs or Google Slides where you can go insert drawing. I always encourage people to actually go to Google Drawings because they get more tools that way. So many times I've shown Google Drawings and people are used to going insert drawing and you just have a a very limited number of tools. If you actually go to Google Drawings itself, set up your drawing, you can actually copy that and paste it into the insert drawing that you're doing on Google Docs. And all of the things that you did that you didn't have tools for are now in there. So So you can still have that drawing attached to that document, but you had use of all of the tools that are in the full Google Drawings. That's a great tip. And, you, you know, I, I totally agree with you that, that drawings is sort of this unsung hero. It's a very powerful tool. But I know when I teach it, it's usually the thing that no one's ever tried in the room. Yeah. And I, I think, it, you know, I've said this before, but I think because it's a blank canvas, nobody knows what to do with it. You know, they just see that. And also because those tools that you're talking about are contextual. And so until they begin to add things, they don't actually see those extra little toolbars start popping up. But you can create some amazing things. And of course, putting this in the hands of students is even more powerful. But the ability to make some interactive activities with Google Drawings is also very powerful. You know, we have, like Matt was talking about, the ability to bring the two worlds together, the text and the images, but to interact. Oh, yeah. And because it's in Google, it's collaborative. Absolutely. Any of these activities could be, you know, individual or or they could be partners or groups. So um, have you have you done anything that's a little more collaborative in terms of using Google Drawings? Um, we, we do a little bit here and there, but most of the time I use it to try to get that kid who doesn't want to get up at the board, who who wants to demonstrate their learning or do something creative, doing it with them at their own machine, just takes away that pressure of being in front of a group. And I'm one of those, you know, I would rather Mm -hmm. be sitting at my device instead of standing up in front of a lot of people. Um, But being able to do it right there, it just takes away that that level of nervousness that that a student may have. Absolutely. I, mm-hmm. And that's true for so many digital tools. I mean, oh, yeah. it, it opens the doors for um, the quiet introverts uh, who, who won't raise their hand and they won't ask the questions in class either, but they might be willing to ask it online. So I, right. I love that point. Throw it in a yeah. back channel or, you know, introverted teachers like Casey and I um, will we'll hop on social media and be all kinds of, you know, interactive. Um, but uh but yeah, I we can fake, we can fake it on social media. Yeah. We can, we can. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those closet introverts too. Where, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm right here with that. you guys. We get done with a no. I, it's a it's the truth. I do a really good job of painting it on when I'm when I'm out <laughs> out and everything. But whenever I get done with a presentation, all I want to do if I'm at a conference is go back to my hotel room and like crash on the bed and just be alone for a little while. So, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, now. Um, Wanda, to tie back to what you were talking about earlier, a lot of these activities and the way that we're using them sound very student-centered, which I love. And when we talk about student-centered learning, it doesn't just have to be for students in a K-12 classroom, that self-directed, sort of like, you know, almost like student-centered professional learning for teachers is, is a big deal, too. And it sounds like it's very much at the heart of what we're talking about here and I'd say that creativity can even tie into um, can tie into professional learning. And I know um, you're are, are you wrapping up your doctorate on this topic? Yes, yes. So I'm um, I'm in the dissertation phase of my of my uh, doctor of education in instructional design and technology at the University of Memphis. It's actually a, a fully online doctorate. So wow. even though I'm in town. Uh, and it's at the University of Memphis, I was able to complete all the coursework and, and such without having to go to campus, um, which is a big deal. But yes, my focus is on self-directed professional learning, uh, and I'm focusing on teachers looking at how they're doing their own self-directed learning 
the barriers they face, the benefits they see of it, and then how can a school district help support that? You know, I mean, it's obviously a big issue with teachers being fed knowledge from professional development. The research shows, the literature shows, as my advisor would say, is the teacher knows what their classroom needs. And if they're going to spend three hours learning how to do a particular thing, whether it's technology or otherwise, that should count for something. It should be balanced out with the the compliance things that school districts have to do. But we need to respect the knowledge that teachers come into our profession with and not make them sit through sessions that they already understand. Um, But we also need to be able to say, If you need to learn how to do this, here, I'll help you with the resources and we'll count that as your required hours or whatever that might be. And so I've just kind of been looking at the background of that and trying to kind of lay some some foundations for that. Amen, sister. Right. <laughs> and you know, I think I think part of it is going to be, I, I bet you would agree with this, is um, not so much just offering professional learning in that way, but also getting the the mindset of teachers to shift too. Because for so many years, it's been professional learning means I go into the library after school is over with, with my lesson plan book and my grading, and I sit down and somebody talks. And it's probably not anything that's very useful to me. And I'm going to sit and grade because I have to be there. And it's like seat time. I think there's that mindset shift that needs to happen where, hey, you can go learn what it is that you need to learn. And I think whenever teachers grab hold of that, I think there's going to be a huge you know, surge in, in the kind of cool things that are going to happen in the classroom as a result. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I, I, oh, sorry, Casey, but I mean, no, a, a lot of teachers are out there doing it already and they're going to right. keep doing it. Yes. Um, but it, it provides a certain level of respect when a school district can say, I see that you're doing this. I see that it's making a difference with our students. Let me recognize that. Whether it's with a micro-credential, whether it's with an extra stipend, um, the the challenge, I think, comes more from the uh, the, the level above the teacher um, in how does a school district then say, well, if I'm going to recognize you participating in this one-hour Twitter chat, how am I going to be able to to justify that to somebody? Um, and that's where I always turn to doing some reflective practice, going into the classroom and using it there, and then being able to reflect after that to say, did this make a difference? Did it not? It's okay if it doesn't make a difference. We learned from that lesson. Now let's go on to something else. It's such a powerful uh, thing that you're studying here. And kudos, by the way, on your 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 dissertation. Uh, I'm doing my little uh, Wayne's World. I, I'm not worthy dance I'm over here. <laughs> so, but I mean, and I of course completely agree. But I think you are doing some fantastic things in your own school system to help teachers sort of take ownership of their own professional learning and sharing, you know, these meaningful little tech tips and newsletters and your fabulous sketch note tips uh, that I, I'm sure you've been sharing. And have you seen any results and any teachers that maybe have been resistant that you've sort of gotten on the bandwagon? Not really so much resistant, but overworked. <laughs> um, we, True. <laughs> we, we, we opened a new middle school this year. Um, we had I'd been just an elementary prior to this year, but we opened a new middle school in the fall. And so we basically doubled the size of our school district and we opened that new school one-to-one digital curriculum. We rolled out a new student information system, a new LMS, all in in August. It, it was yes. pretty Oh my. Crazy. Um, so a lot of these teachers haven't been with us before. So there are a lot of district things they're having to learn. I mean, the, the list of things they're having to do is just mind boggling. And some of them have been familiar with Google and some haven't. But I'll tell you, they have hit the ground running. Um, we took a handful to our state tech conference. And after the first day, one of the teachers had already gotten on and done her level one Google exam. And uh, Yay. She's, I know. <laughs> so I'm hoping that that fire spreads as well, because um, yeah. it gets exhausting if you're the only one trying to spread the, the, the edge of goodness, you know. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're and, doing it. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to say too. Is that your <laughs> your spreading is going way beyond the the state of Tennessee, where I can well, see. Good. Good. I mean, just through just through Twitter, I can already see the impact that's having in your state, but also beyond. So, um, Wanda, this has been great. Um, if anybody wants to. L- to know more about you or the kinds of things you're doing, or, you know, obviously we, we're going to have links in our show notes right. at Google teacher tribe.com slash 36, where you can get Wanda's lesson. But if they want to get in contact with you, where's the best place to go? Uh, Twitter is definitely a good place to hit me up. Um, I'm at W T E R R A L on Twitter. Um, but if you go to about dot me slash ed tech, Yes, I was an early adopter, so I got slash ed tech, and you can find all my contact information there. All right. Very good. Well, again, thank you so much, Wanda, for joining us and for all of these great ideas. We appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get right into the mailbag where we get to hear from you, the tribe. And we wanted to start this off with a review that we got on iTunes for the podcast. And so this one comes from someone who titled themselves as Southern Eagle Girl. And it says, I am super excited to tune in each week and hear the latest G Suite updates, tips, tricks, guest speakers, blog posts from Matt and Casey. They provide the perfect amount of information. She just said perfect. She said perfect. Oh my I gosh. know, I know. To digest while on my commute and then implement on the same day, which of course we love. The show notes are always packed full of fabulous resources that I often revisit. I'm happy to serve as a walking advertisement for Matt and Casey. Now I'm picturing one of those sandwich boards, you know, where <laughs> we're like walking around, there's one on the front, one on the back, because I love to share the Google Teacher Tribe goodness in each of my sessions. I uh, love that. Thank you so much, Southern Eagle Girl. And if you haven't left a review on iTunes, we would absolutely love that. That does uh, help other people find the podcast a little bit easier. So we would love to hear your feedback in a review. And I do want to mention, we did not pay her to say that. <laughs> right. That's true. That's true. <laughs> we, we don't, in Southern Eagle Girl, let us know who you are. We, we are excited uh, to, to share that review, but we, yeah. we had nothing to do with it. And we're very honored by, by that review. So thank you. Yes. Our next question comes from Nikki in Winnipeg. And she has a question about one of the newer features in Google Drive that shows the, the quick access at the, the beginning. And so this is going to be a voicemail. So take it away, Nikki. My name is Nikki from Winnipeg, Manitoba. I had a question about Google Drive. Every time I open my Google Drive at the top, it shows my quick access. And typically it always tells me that I had edited files today that I hadn't edited or that I hadn't opened. Is there some setting that I have on that I don't know about? I would love an answer. Thanks so much. Bye. Okay, Nikki. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you are are looking at the top at quick access, which should be showing you that the files that you have been in recently or the files that Google's trying to predict you may need based on earlier behavior. So I'm guessing that you're seeing what I'm seeing with mine right now. And it says you edited today and you're claiming that you didn't actually edit that. So the thing that I would do is I would actually click on the the file, just the little thumbnail, don't open it. And then go over to the right and towards the top, you'll find the little I in the circle. That's your details button. And if you, while having that, that file selected and you click on that details button, it should tell you exactly what has happened in that file and when. It's time stamped. Maybe it's a collaborative file that someone else maybe has edited, but I'm guessing there could also be some automations you have set up that you forgot about maybe that are feeding into it, like a form um, running or an add-on or something could possibly do that. But I'm not completely sure what's going on if somebody else is in your stuff, but um, that's where I would start. I would go look at the activity tab and, and see what's been going on there. Totally agree. I think that would be a good place to start. All right. Our next question comes from Sarah Campbell from Woodbury Schools. And she has a question about something that we just recently touched on in a recent episode, and that is Google Home and using the Google Assistant. So Sarah, take it away. 
Hey guys, I love the idea of using a Google Home in the classroom, and I recently had a preschool teacher reach out to me saying she would like to use one just for the hands-free aspect, um, so she could say, hey Google, play transition music, or hey Google, play the weather song, whatever it is. Um, I reached out to my technology coordinator, and he has a few concerns, so I would like to know what other people are doing to get around these, um, about the having a recording device and the laws like COPA and FERPA and all those other concerns, because right now I'm hitting a roadblock with him. So if I could have some feedback from other people that are already using this and their network is allowing them to use it, that would be awesome. Thank you. Okay, Sarah. So this is really interesting because I just had an email today from somebody else who is asking a very similar question. And so here, here's kind of my take on it is that if we have these Google Home or Alexa or whatever in our classroom, that first of all, the way that they're built, they're only supposed to be collecting voice when we activate them. And the other thing about that is that whenever we speak into them, there's no identifying information that's tied to it. So if you think about it, if the Google Home is connected to your Google account, then basically anybody else that might ask it a question is running it through your Google account. There's there's no personally identifying information tied to it. So what I'm thinking, and again, I'm just going off the top of my head here. This is just just me thinking. And if anybody else has more specific information about this, we would love to hear about it. But I'm thinking if students were to use a Google Home in the classroom that's tied to a teacher uh, Google account, there's no personally identifying information on it that the students are using it under the supervision of the teacher. Um, I know whenever schools have uh, like a class Twitter account, um, whenever the students use that, even though they're not old enough to use it by themselves due to the, the terms of service, they're using it under the supervision of the teacher. Um, and if we're not publishing anything, putting anything out there, um, I know that that information is being collected, but it's not being tied to anyone's identity. So I'm trying to think of the negative side effects to that other than just Google getting the search term, but that's no different than putting a search term into a regular Google search. Um, so if it's not tied to us personally, other than being tied to our Google account, I can't see a whole lot of the drawbacks. But again, I'll be I'll be interested to hear if anybody else has a has a take on that. You definitely had some some good points there that I had never thought about, Matt, in terms of it being connected back to that one account. You know, I think a lot of people have privacy concerns just in general with these devices, even our phones that are sort of constantly listening. Um, but that, like you said, uh, there is a, a special trigger. And I think if we're smart about it and we pay attention to the way these things are set up and ask these questions. So thank you, Sarah. That was, was a very good question to bring up. And um, I'm sure many of you have uh, addressed this with, with your own administrators. So please let us know what you address and how you're making this work so that we can help Sarah use this device in her classroom. The last one that we've got, uh, this is a, a contact from Cameron Ross, Cam from Melbourne, Australia. And so he says, hi, Casey and Matt. While I'm only new to the podcast, I really enjoy listening every week as there is always heaps of ready-made tools I can share and also implement in my classroom. And we know that he's an Aussie if he just used the word heaps. And he says, it was great catching up with Matt at the Teach Tech Play conference in April this year, which was a phenomenal conference I got to go to in Melbourne, Australia. And I very clearly remember seeing Cam there. And he's looking forward to meeting Casey next year. Casey, you're going to be doing this conference next April, aren't you? I am. So I, I will be in Australia in 2018. And I am super excited about that. So maybe I will start using the word heaps. <laughs> you should. There's a bunch of them. I've, I learned all sorts of Aussieisms for things that we don't say here in the United States. So it will be a learning experience for you for sure. Oh, yeah. We'll probably do some sort of trade. I'll give them the, the Texas version and then they can tell me how to say it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I would love to be there for that. Bless his heart. Thank you, Cam. Uh, we appreciate that. We appreciate hearing from you. And the opportunity to work with educators in Australia. The Google Teacher Tribe podcast is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. The Education Podcast Network. 
podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. For more great education podcasts, go to edupodcastnetwork.com. Okay, Tribe, Matt and I, of course, have a few things to share from our blogs, and I have a special announcement, and Matt has a special announcement. It's a very right. special day. Very it special. is Christmas Day, and we have two very special opportunities for all of you. So I want to let you know that my Google Certified Educator Academy is open for enrollment. That means right now you can jump into my VIP course and get started working on becoming a Google Certified Educator Level 1 today. So if you have always thought about it, or maybe you haven't, maybe now now you're really beginning to think, what is this whole Google certification thing? Um, check it out. I've got free resources and free videos that will explain everything. So it is all at googlecertifiededucator.com. I only open this course twice a year. The VIP version is only open twice a year. So grab your seat while you can. It will close at midnight on January 1st, 2018. So you have just a few more days to jump into the course and you can get started right away. And then for me, I've got an opportunity for you also. Um, I've still got the Ditch That Textbook Digital Summit open. And the the Digital Summit is a free online course for teachers. We have a wide variety of topics, um, nine great presentations. And if you're only just catching on to this right now, you're in luck because from now until December 31st, all of the videos have already been released and you can go watch any of them that you want. You can get uh, free certificates for professional development credits whenever you watch the videos, but it's only open until December 31st. That's when at the end of that day, basically on you know New Year's Eve when the clock strikes 12, then the digital summit is over. It's just like a conference. The lights go out. Everybody's got to go home and all of those video presentations go offline. So if you want to check that out, get some professional development hours and get some new uh, inspiring creative creative ideas for the classroom for the new year, then go to ditchsummit.com to get signed up and check out those videos. So again, that's ditchsummit.com. So tribe, did you guys love that interview with Wanda just as much as we did? I we've been we've been I know we've been looking forward to talking to her for so long. And I love all the practical ideas that she has. She also has a blog at ignitionedu.com where you can go check out some of the things that she shared there too. But but Casey, wasn't she awesome? She was, and you need to definitely go check out the lesson plan that she shared with us. It's yes. also in the show notes. She's got tons of links and even explanations to walk teachers through the entire lesson. So very powerful information there for using Google Drawings to tap into creativity in the classroom. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that that about wraps this up, Matt. Yeah, and thanks so much again for listening. Uh, if you haven't gone to iTunes to do a rating and or review, please do that if you can. And also stay with us on the GT Tribe hashtag on Twitter. And other than that, we will see you on the next episode of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. Merry Christmas, y'all. Thanks for listening to the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. Keep up with every new episode by subscribing on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, and by visiting googleteachertribe.com. Get in on the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag GTTribe. Until next time, keep harnessing the G Suite power, and may the Googles be with you. Yes, I do. Hang on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the wrong page. Sorry, Chris. Uh, <laughs> I, I was, this is what happens when I'm multitasking and I'm, I'm recording. So, Do you want to tell them about it? Uh, not really. Hang okay. On. Well, that does it for this episode of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. Wait for it. Merry Christmas, y'all. <laughs> we'll catch you on the next episode. Bye, y'all. <laughs> okay.